Good day, everyone. Welcome to one of our bite-sized videos of which the purpose is to bring you, the integrator, up to speed with some of the basic concepts surrounding the Flowgear integration experience, as well as take a brief dive into one of our popular use cases. We're going to start by exploring the screen in front of you, the Flowgear console, which is the very first thing you'll be greeted with after logging into Flowgear. The Flowgear console provides access to all the components relevant to your integrations. From here, you can navigate to spaces that facilitate the setup for different parts of the integration. The three primary spaces that I'd like to briefly touch on are the workflows, connections, and drop points. Workflows can be found by navigating to the workflow section over here. And workflows provide a canvas from which you can drag and drop connectors and tooling provided by the Flowgear platform and construct your integration according to your business rules. We will go more in depth around workflows once we start to explore the specific use case. Connections, which we can navigate to by clicking over here, are spaces with which you can provide credentials that allow you to authenticate and connect to the systems which you would like to integrate with. We can go ahead and click on the new button over here, and we can go ahead and select a particular connector to work with. And connect, choosing any one of the connectors we can see here within the connector section, such as ConnectWise Manage, you'll see there's a space in which you can plug in credentials that are relevant to that specific platform. You then have the option of providing credentials for different profiles, such as test and production, and you will be able to run your workflow or integration within that profile, which will then target that specific environment that you've set up. If you set up your credentials correctly, you can click on the play button over here, which if successful, will give you a green banner telling you that the test succeeded. Finally, we have the drop point section. The idea behind the drop points is that it is our solution to hybrid on-prem and cloud integrations. You can install the drop point agent onto your on-prem servers, which will allow us then to talk to those servers within the scope of what you allow us to do using the whitelisting features. This means that we can talk to your file systems, we can talk to your AD, or we can move data between CRMs and ERPs that are not exposed to the internet with the drop point. These three spaces are the most important aspects related to the integrations themselves within Flowgear. For a deeper dive into the elements that make up the Flowgear console, please see our bite-sized video focusing on navigating the Flowgear console. Next, we're going to take a deeper dive into workflows and nodes. To do this, we're going to navigate to the workflow section, which we have done by clicking on this workflow over here. And from there, we're going to open up a new workflow by clicking on the new button right over here, at which point we're given the option to name the workflow, which we can name it appropriately, and click on the OK button over here, at which point you are then greeted with the Flowgear Design Canvas, the purpose of which is to provide you with the space to drag and drop Flowgear tooling in a specific sequence and order to string it together and then form the basis of an integration from end to end. Now to start dropping the tooling onto the canvas, we're going to click this plus icon over here, which is going to open up a list of our nodes. All of these little blocks are what we consider nodes. And simply put, a node is a function or set of functions that have been encapsulated in a certain way that the most complex aspects of it have been obscured from you and only the parts that you have to interact with are exposed. Now within our nodes, we have distinct categories. And the first category you can see here are the connectors. The connectors are responsible for talking to the systems with which you would like to integrate. And so all of the complexity around authenticating and talking to these platforms is hidden behind the node. And again, only the most relevant aspects of the node are exposed to you. Triggers are nodes that allow you to determine how a workflow should kick off. So it gives you architectural freedom around when a workflow should run and how it should run. In other words, if you would like a workflow to run twice daily or every 15 minutes, or perhaps on receiving a particular email, triggers will facilitate that process. Processes are the nodes that are responsible for actually supplementing, transforming, and enriching the data sets that you need to work with. So when you receive data from system A and needs to be transformed to a different structure so that system B can ingest it, the processes are there to facilitate that functionality as well as implement further business rules that you may have necessary for your integration. And then finally, evaluators are the nodes that are going to have a look at the result of a transaction and allow you to kick off additional supporting logic within that workflow. In other words, should a transaction fail, does somebody need to be emailed? Does someone have to be informed in some way? Does a report have to be built? So, so on and so forth. These four categories encapsulate all the tools that Flogia provides the integrator, allowing you to build both simple and complex integrations within the scope of a simplified experience. 
The use case I'd like to show you today involves the movement of customer information out of QuickBooks and into Salesforce as accounts. Hopefully by the end of this demo, you have the idea of how to build something using the QuickBooks node and how samples are generated within QuickBooks. The first thing we're going to do is head to the design canvas and actually kick off this process. To do so, we're going to open up a brand new workflow by clicking on the new button over there. And we'll go ahead and name this appropriately. And we're then greeted with our design canvas where we can start to drag and drop the appropriate nodes that we're looking to work with. First and foremost, if you're wanting to get data out of QuickBooks, we're going to use QuickBooks as the first node. We're then going to apply a quick map node, which is going to be responsible for transforming those data sets. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and apply the Salesforce node where the accounts will be created. The next step after identifying which nodes you want to work with is to set up connections into these environments. We can do so by clicking on the connection drop down over here, in which case I will select one that I've already set up, but I'll show you what that looks like. If you are creating one for the first time, you'll be greeted with a very similar screen like this. And for QuickBooks, it's as simple as using the connect your account button. And that will then take you to a login screen where you can then go and confirm access uh, to QuickBooks through your Flowgear account. And then you will be able to get the credentials uh, plugged back into the screen here. We can go ahead and test against that. So we can see that our credentials are in fact still working. And now we can do something very similar for Salesforce where we go ahead and pick a particular account or connection. The next step is to now prime the nodes for the particular actions that we want them to perform. Now in the case of QuickBooks, we would like to go and query some customer information. So what we're going to do is we're gonna click on the, the little icon over there and say choose sample. That's going to bring up a list of potential actions that we can perform against that site or that uh, product. In this case, we are going to search for something called customer. And so we can go ahead and look for query a customer. That primes the node for the particular action we'd like to perform, but also provides us with a sample query that we're going to use to actually get the data, which we can leave as is. Um, now we can go ahead and do something similar for Salesforce also generate a list of actions against that particular site or environment. We'll go ahead and look for create account. Click on that. And now this node is also primed for a create account action as well as having a sample payload. So now we can go ahead and drag the result into request to make sure the quick map is aware of the data we're trying to map to. And with respect to QuickBooks, we can go and get some data from the system by running that node in isolation. So what we can do is we can click on the options window over here and we can say run this node. That's going to bring up a workflow activity log, which is showing us what actually happened for that particular transaction. And we can see at the end of it here at the response, we've got a list of two customers that we can work with, which we're then going to use as sample data for our mapping. Once that's been done, the quick map now has access to both what the, the source and target data should look like. So we can head into the quick map UI by clicking on this change view and that's going to bring up the data trees, left and right hand side, left hand side being QuickBooks, right hand side being Salesforce, and give us an idea of what Salesforce is expecting in terms of a structure. Now the primary purpose of this particular tool is to give you a easy to use UI to overwhelmingly reduce the, the amount of effort required to actually map these things structurally speaking. So we can start by doing that by dragging the structure such as each customer should be an account. We can then go and get names such as give a name in there. And uh, we'll immediately see that the preview on the right hand side is popping up, giving us information as to the data that was in QuickBooks, but in the structure or format that Salesforce is expecting it. So now we can go ahead and get a couple more of these fields mapped in. As you can see, the preview is fleshing out a bit more there with some more of the information that we need to create these accounts. Now, beyond the structural mapping, QuickMap also provides you with the ability to further enrich and supplement that data. This is very important. Most production use cases require you to validate or have that data uh, taken to the next level of cleanliness. 
And the way that we allow you to do this is by providing you with a list of Excel-like functions inside of these filter expressions that you can use to then take your data to the next step. These functions include string and math operations. So if you can think of uh, if and sum and count, lookups, those kinds of things, you have accessibility to all of those things in the space. A good example would be, for instance, a bit of string manipulation where we're going to provide first and last name to the same field and simply go and add it together. You can see that immediately represent in the name preview over there. Uh, you can then go and do stuff like uppercase on the city. You can limit your street by a certain amount of characters by using left. And the list of functions goes on. Ultimately, this tool is there to provide you with a very easy UI to go and map the data and make sure that it's in the right format, as well as run any functions to get it to that last level of cleanliness that you require. Now, as we have our preview here looking good, we can go ahead and close this off. And now we can hook up our execution flows from point to point. Now that that execution flow is determining which node needs to execute after which node, we can actually run the entire workflow one after the other. We can have a look at the result of some of these nodes happening here on the, on the uh, canvas. We already know what's coming from QuickBooks. We can take a look at what the result from the quick map was, which should be exactly what we saw in our uh, preview. So no surprises there. And then ultimately we can take a look at the response from Salesforce, which is giving us a success flag of true for both of these. So both of these have been created and we have got a unique ID for that particular account or for each of those accounts. This does represent the core of what it would look like to use the node in this capacity. Um, it is obviously not production ready. You will want to add additional error handling and you will want to add additional logic that's either going to be available to you through the tooling that I've already shown you here or additional tooling that you can find on the canvas. The last few features I'd like to touch on are enterprise API, revision and release management. I'd like to show you where you can find those features and what they're all about. So as we start with enterprise API, it is effectively the ability to turn any workflow into an API bound endpoint. So to do this, you can head to the workflow settings on the top here. You can then navigate to the section that allows you to apply a binding as well as a custom domain where this URL is then secured against an API key or a certificate and can be reached by any third party application or program to pass data into or get data from Flowgear real time. The next feature I'd like to touch on then is revision management. You can find that feature by clicking on the revision history button over here. And ultimately what this is, is the ability to see when changes were made, who they were made by, and what those versions of the workflows look like. You can then open those versions of the workflows by clicking on the open button here for any particular version. We'll go to the very first one where we see there was actually nothing at that point. You can then choose to revert to this version if you would like to. The last feature I'd like to touch on is release management. You can find that feature by clicking on the promote workflow button over here. And what this brings up is a UI which allows you to merge your test into your UAT and eventually in production. Effectively, what this means is when a save is made, which I will do now. That save is not actually saved against the UAT or production environment until it's explicitly merged into that space. Now you do not have to use this UI. The purpose of this particular feature is that it's actually backed in this case by GitHub, which provides you with a competent platform in which you can then run your change control policy that you've had up until this point. So if we open up this commit over here, we can find that it brings up the GitHub UI, which gives us an idea of what changed from then till now. From here, we can run a, a pull request or whatever it is that you've been doing up until now, uh, and then obviously merge that into production and that will then reflect inside of Flowgear here as a production ready workflow. Now that we've shown you how to build a workflow, if at any point you have to go back and see what happened in that workflow, you can navigate to the workflow logs over here. For more detailed information on the topics we explored today, or if you would like to explore more complex aspects of the platform, including architecture and best practices, please join us for our technical certification course hosted on udemy.com. Also, go ahead and check out some of our other bite-sized videos for more common use cases and platform features. Also, please go ahead and visit our website where you can register for a free trial and complimentary proof of concept, have a look at our unique pricing model, or explore our list of over 200 pre-built connectors. Thank you very much for joining me for this short demo. Have a lovely day further.